Good morning, TCC. Great to see you here. I wish you a very happy new year. Normally, we get you up to at least talk to each other, shake each other's hands, say hello, wish each other a happy year. We can't be doing that. Uh, we've still got masks on and uh, we've still got some rules. Before we really start our service together, a couple of very quick things. Uh, just a reminder, your mask has got to stay on until you're seated, which you are allowed to sing without your mask on. When we leave, now I tell you, I'm going to impose this now because I'm getting in so much trouble. There is a one-way system. <laughs> Everybody look at the doors at the back, you ain't going there. We're going out those doors, all right? Now I know this hasn't worked very well. In fact, it hasn't worked at all. So I'm considering chaining those back doors at the end of the service. If you could leave this way, the town hall will be much happier. Uh, and that will make me feel better. You will also notice that uh, you've got a new requirement for communion. <laughs> We've not used these at church. We know other churches have used these very successfully. However, can I give you a bit of suggestion? All right. There are two little tags to put. There's a top one, which kind of lets you see a little bit of white bread there, and then there's a bottom one. During the service, or maybe before we get to communion, you might want to peel them back a bit. All right, because otherwise we'll end up with communion wine all over the place, uh, and then you'll be sitting there and we would have done communion, you still can't open. So have a fiddle. If you've got someone older on your table, um, you know, so if you've got older people on your table, just help them out a little bit, just uh, undo it. <laughs> just help them out. Uh, it, they are a bit fiddly. If you want to share communion as part of our view. So, how do we begin our time together? Well, I'm going to read. I'm going to read from the psalm, and then we're going to stand and we're going to sing together. One of the great things the psalmist reminds us of is that we are not alone. Now, for us as a church, our new year begins with excitement. It begins with a whole 12 months of being able to serve God, but it is tinged with sadness. Many of you will already know uh, of the passing uh, on New Year's Eve friend and our brother Simon. Um, he's now with the Lord. Uh, we believe that and we're going to give thanks for his life a little later in our service. But I want to take the opportunity to thank so many of you. Uh, and you know who you are. You've loved him, cared for him. You have changed his life in the years that he's been with us. Uh, and thank you for all that you have done. Uh, I know you did it for the Lord uh, and you did it for Simon, but we really do appreciate it. Uh, so thank you. Uh, but what does the word of God say? Listen to what the psalmist says. I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and of earth. He will not let my foot slip. He who watches over me will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you and the new moon by night. The Lord will keep you from harm and will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your comings and goings both now and forever. We're going to stand, we're going to sing and we're going to worship the Lord. Let's <laughs>
goodness of God. So what have we got to give thanks to God for? Yeah, it's been a tough year, but what can we thank God for this morning? You tell me. That we're here. Our God. What else can we thank God for? Don't be backwards and coming forwards if you're a child of God. We've just said we should shout His praise. Each other. His His promises. Well, I'm afraid. His faithfulness, his promises, his forgiveness. There's no good singing worship songs if you don't believe them. That's right, isn't it? We worship God for the year that's gone by. We praise him for the goodness. As Heather's reminded us, we are here together. That's a miracle in itself. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. As we have sung your praise and your worship, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, that you were willing to come. Lord, as we remember that later in our service, Lord, let our hearts be warmed again to that great truth. Lord, thank you that we are here as your children gathered together in this place and your spirit is amongst us. We don't deserve that. Yet you've given it to us out of the goodness and the mercy of your heart. Lord, we thank you that you have given us each other And as we mourn the loss of Simon this morning, as we remember all that he has meant to us, as we remember all that he has given to us and the opportunity we have had to share love with him, we commend him into your hands. We know he is out of pain and he is with you and that is far better. Lord, we pray that as with Simon, anyone who walks through this door in their time of need, we as a congregation will show love. Lord, we pray this morning in our time of worship, in our time of communion, as we listen to testimony, Lord, we ask you will stir our hearts if we've grown cold. You will fire us for a new year to reach out and share the good news of Jesus with everybody and anybody who will listen. Lord, be with us now in the rest of our service. In Jesus' name we ask you. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Leslie's going to come and read a really familiar passage to us from God's Word. Well, is this 
Psalm of David, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of darkness, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. With your rod and your staff to comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you, Leslie. Well, as I say, uh, we couldn't start the new year without at least a few notices. I have an allergy to notices and services, but they've got to be done today. A couple of things, hopefully. You picked up one of these. Um, they're not in that format yet, but that's what they're meant to look like, okay? Uh, you will have a very happy afternoon trying to stick them together. Uh, there is a sticky bit on them, you fold them. This is a text for the year, uh, and uh, this is the text we elders have chosen uh, to lead us through the year. We're going to look at that a little bit later. It might be um, a, a translation you're not familiar with, it's from the New Living Translation, um, but it's, uh, it's a great thing to take us through the year. Uh, second thing to remind you of uh, is, again, uh, that we are still in COVID restrictions of some sort. There will be many of our friends. We've got a lot of our friends still very unwell. So we've got those, nobody else, as far as I know, at the moment with COVID, we've got those who've come out of hospital, uh, and we're pleased that the likes of Bob House is back home, uh, and uh, that Frank's eye operation went really well. Uh, but there are others that we need to pray for. Can I encourage you over these next few days, one month? They're not here today, phone them up and just say, look, we missed you, how are you doing? And then we pray for anything you need. You know, we were really good at that during COVID lockdown. Well, we might not be in the same lockdown, but we still need to care and help one another. Last thing, uh, Tuesday is uh, Connect Group. So look out for the email. Uh, there'll be an email coming out to you, Connect Group online. If you don't like doing stuff online, I know you don't, Connect Group is really good. It's a great time for us to pray together, to share news together as a church. You don't have to come on video. You can come on and turn your video camera off if you don't want anyone to look at you. Uh, you can do that. Uh, if you really want, you can turn your sound off, which is not quite as cool. Um, but come along. Uh, it'll be at 7.30 uh, Tuesday night, Connect Group. Watch out for the email. Now, one of the things is always a privilege is that we have visitors as a church. And this morning, we're privileged to uh, have Sheila's family with us. Uh, we have Ian and Alison and Luca with us all the time, which is always a blessing. Um, but we have Annie and Kath with us. And Annie, if you'd like, just come up and uh, you're going to pray for us in a minute. In fact, we're going to pray for the church nationally uh, as we come out of uh, COVID, hopefully. But Andy, uh, you're a pastor of the church. Where are you pastor? Okay, I'm an associate pastor at a church called Shaman Chapel in Edinburgh. In Edinburgh, so you, you clearly don't have a Scottish accent. Um, where, no. where, where are you? Well all... spotted, Phil. I see your you sharpness say, is still with us. I don't know. You will notice that, that myself and Andy have been in some church together at least. Uh, I had the privilege of, of being one of two people who managed to break Andy's hand on his very first day uh, at the church we grew up in London at the youth. Uh, it came to a youth night, always a mistake, for which I completely apologize. I'm sure I've apologized many times for that. How I can you... show you the wound afterwards. Oh, it is still here. Yeah. Uh, how did it stop? Um, Scotland is different, so for example, we've just sung without masks. We're not allowed to do that yet in Scotland. Um, and that's, uh, that's really hard, when you're used to gathering in a good number and uh, singing the praises of God. So we're just looking forward to the time when those restrictions will be lifted. We're not quite sure when that will happen. Um, we are also, uh, we have yet to um, reach our pre-COVID levels, if I can say that, because like many churches, there are vulnerable adults that we have uh, with us here uh, and others. Equally, at the same time, there are those who, because of COVID, are seeking what is the meaning of life. And uh, we are encouraged by those who are coming along and hearing the gospel and, and some folks are being saved. So God is good to us. Lovely to have you here, Anne Catherine. We're so pleased to join us this morning. You lead us in prayer as we come to the time. Thank you. So I'm going to be praying. Uh, both for our country and then I'll be praying for the world as well. So let's pray. Father, as we want to pray for our country, we remind ourselves that you are the God who rules and reigns. You're sovereign, you are good, you're gracious. 
And Father, we thank you therefore that we can lift our prayers before you for our land. Father, we want to uh, thank you that as we come into 2022, Father, that we are conscious of difficulties and stresses. We thank you so much for our NHS and we thank you for the many who work within it. And we thank you for the care and support that so many of us are able to receive. And Father God, we do pray for those who work uh, within that particular sector and we pray for those who are struggling with COVID at this time. We pray they would know your help. Father, we pray for our national leaders. We pray that you would give them great wisdom. Father, we are so conscious of the tensions that exist in our land as to what should and shouldn't be done. Father, we do pray uh, that you would give our leaders clarity, that they would be those who with integrity uh, interpret the data for the blessing of the people that they are entrusted with. Father, we want to pray above all really for the gospel needs of our land. Father, we realise that COVID is terrible, but Father, we're also aware that people who die uh, without Christ are lost eternally. And we want to pray so much for the uh, gospel needs of our land. Father, for men and women who do not know Jesus, who do not love him, who do not follow him, for those who are lost, those who have been blinded by the agendas of the age and the sovereign God, our heart cries out that you would enable us to both show and share the wonderful love of Jesus Christ. Um, Father, have mercy upon our land. Move upon us again. And Father, help each one of us here, Father, to live for you wherever you've put us. May we so delight in your Lordship that wherever we are, whoever we meet, there would be something of the aroma, something of the fragrance, something of the beauty of Christ. And may we be those who are ready and able to respond with the good news of Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you for the national initiative that's coming up. Uh, this year, Father, we pray for passion for life. We thank you that so many churches are engaged in this uh, way of communicating the gospel. We thank you for the superb resources that have been produced. And Father, as there is this national move of gospel churches to proclaim Christ, we pray that this would be greatly used. And Father, that this would have an impact upon our land. So we cry out to you, Father, for our country. But we also want to pray for our world. And Father, as we lift up our eyes from our own situation, we want to pray for our brothers and sisters in the persecuted church. We do particularly remember those in the church in Nigeria. We realise that there is no land where there is greater persecution than Nigeria. And Father, we do particularly pray for our brothers and sisters, especially in the north, who are undergoing intense persecution at this time. Father, we do pray for the land of uh, North Korea, and our brothers and sisters who are there, and we thank you for the bold way that they are living. Give them discernment. May they be very conscious of your grace and help. And Father, again, we bring before you Afghanistan and the needs of your people in that land. And Father, as we think of our world, again, we want to pray for the many unreached people groups who still are around our planet. Father, forgive us that we get so comfortable and in our own little bubbles. And Father, forget the great gospel need that is out there. Father, we remind ourselves that the call is to go and make Christ known to all people. And, and therefore, Father, help us to make disciples of all nations. And Father, we pray, even from Seller Church, would you raise up those who are going to go into cross-cultural mission for the glory and honour of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we ask all of these things. Amen. 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 things that we want to do at the beginning of the year is to stop and to be reminded of the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he has done for us. Let's listen to the words of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah writes these words from Isaiah 53, reminds us years before it happened of what Jesus came to do. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He, Jesus grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. 
he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering familiar with pain, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought him peace was a, brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep of God's street. Each of us have turned to our own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. It's what Jesus did for us, that we might have hope and certainty and a life eternal. The Word of God tells us that we should, when we gather together, take a time to reflect. Paul tells the Corinthians that we are to examine our own hearts and our lives before we come and take communion. This is something for those who are Christians who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not for perfect people. Communion and the communion table is not for those who are sinless, but for those whose sin has been forgiven. If you are in that category, if you are part of that, if you have trusted Jesus, then take the bread and take the wine and remember, if you're not a Christian yet here this morning, then here's an opportunity to look to the cross, to see what someone did on your behalf. Confess your sins and trust him right now in these times of life. So we're going to bow our heads, we're going to consider our own lives, and then I'm going to pray. And then we're going to give thanks uh, for this day, this broken body of Jesus. Lord, so often in life and during this year, I guess we are not going to get many moments where we are still as we are at the moment. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you did come and that your body was broken that we might have that eternal life, that we might have a hope that is long beyond this world. And as you were nailed to that cross, you asked the Father in heaven that they, he might forgive. As we take this bread, as we break that bread and eat it, Lord, we remember you and give you the thanks. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. He broke it and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We're going to eat the bread in this case, a wafer, and we're going to remember the Lord Jesus. Let's eat together. As we continue in stillness, let's give thanks for the cup. A reminder of blood shed that sins might be forgiven. Lord Jesus, we thank you again that as you hung there, your blood flowed just as those sacrifices did in the Old Testament. But this, your body, the one true sacrifice, once and for all, Lord Jesus, that that blood cleanses us from every single sin in our life. We find that so hard to comprehend, to understand, and yet we know that is true because you have told us and you have promised it. As we take this cup now, as we, we drink from that, Lord, let our minds be cast not just to Calvary, but to eternity, where we sinlessly will stand before you. Hear our prayer. Thank you from the depths of our being for your shed blood. Amen.
after supper, Jesus took wine from the table. As he took that, he said, drink this, all of you, in remembrance of me. You know I love the old human writer's words. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood to lose all their guilty stains. Let's drink together as an act of fellowship, and let's give thanks. Lord, so often at these moments we just want to remember your church. As we've prayed nationally and globally, we want to pray for TCC. We want to pray for those in our congregation for whom life is just so difficult. We would thank you that Bob it is home. We pray for him and Maureen that you would just give him strength for each new day and help Maureen as she cares for him. Lord, we pray again for ailing and we long for Aileen and John that they might be able to come back amongst us and that Aileen will be well enough to do that. Lord, we continue to pray for John Taylor. We thank you for it. We pray your healing hand upon him. We pray for T and we pray for Ruth. Lord, we continue to pray for each and every member of this congregation for whom their health is a fear and a worry and a struggle. Lord, will you lift them up? Lord, we pray for our young people. Lord, we pray for every young person here, every teenager, uh, every child as they return into school this week. Lord, will you have your hand upon them? We pray for our teaching staff who are here this morning. Lord, we ask that you will come as we as a, a people seek to witness to this community where you placed us. Let us do that effectively. Let us do that as a shining beacon of light in a very dark world. As we pray for ourselves, we do pray. We pray for Angus Church in Scotland. We pray for every church around this country again where your word today will be preached faithfully. Will you save souls? Will you draw back the prodigal sons and daughters? Will you raise up the downcast? And Lord, will your people raise the roof in praise and thanks whenever they are able to? Hear our prayer. Continue with us during our service. In Jesus' name. Well, many of you will know that uh, kind of pre-Christmas we had started to record some my stories where we find out about people in the congregation, their story, how they came to know Jesus. We've seen a few. You will realise, and Chris Minton doesn't know this, but Chris's one didn't work the other week. Sorry, Chris. Uh, so we're going to show that again at some point. But this morning, we're going to watch my story and find out just how another person came to know Jesus. Uh, my name is Lee and this is my story. I grew up in a little uh, village called Norbury um, and then as I grew up I uh, moved to Whitchurch and uh, I was a very passionate kid, loved to get involved with everything um, but uh, you know uh, when my mum and dad split up it was quite difficult at that stage of my life but you know uh, it was still a very loving family, very caring family uh, as I was growing up. When uh, I started my first job uh, and I was going through my training, uh, there was a guy there who was a Christian and we got talking and got to know each other and basically I thought I was a Christian because I believed in God, I believed in a creator but I didn't really know anything about Jesus and he was expl explaining a bit about Jesus and I was interested and but he was the way he lived, he was a he was a true follower of of the Lord Jesus. But uh, at the time, I was challenged by what Jesus had done, and what I did, I rebelled against it. I didn't. It wasn't good news for me at the time. It was a challenge. Growing up, I wanted to live my life how I wanted to live my life. Um, things started getting out of hand because there was like no rules. It was sort of like just live how you want to live and just enjoy life to the maximum. So. My life started escalating out of control with reckless living and um, just not looking after myself. That led into drinking and drugs and uh, um, relationship after relationship and it really got out of hand. Um, 
and basically after a few years of living uh, a wild reckless life you know I was a complete broken person and um, I was suffering with a lot of suicidal depression that lifestyle changed. I started uh, putting all my effort into family life. What happened was I was just hiding all the pain that I've been carrying, all the, the brokenness within. And basically I ran out of steam. I always had this mask on, this, this, uh, this veneer, which uh, you know, I was like this happy go lad, but actually the truth was inside I was, I was, I was broken. I tried everything else in my life to stop this depression and stop look at things in the right way in life and um, I had a I basically I cried out to God in my in my brokenness and, and he answered and he basically said um, read the Bible the Sunday morning I got dressed up smart and I went to church my missus was like where are you going and I was like well, just going to church she was like really <laughs> so uh, anyway at church it was then when I heard the good news about Jesus and what he'd done about um, him dying in my place and about um, those that are in Christ are a new creation and it was about new life, a new start, new hope and it was about what Jesus had done for me personally and it was spoke really powerful to me. I came away from that service and I basically battled with God for a few days about it all and near the end of the week it was basically like holding my hands up in the air and surrendering my life to him, you know, trusting in what he'd done for me. And I had such a life-changing experience. He, he basically took all that, that pain, that suffering, that hurt, that depression away. And he, he filled me with this joy and this peace. And uh, he renewed my life. He, he, he brought me back to life. He has been so faithful, faithful, beyond words you know every time I've been down he's picked me up dusted me off again and I know life with all its challenges he is faithful through everything stories haven't finished yet we've got others that will be going up uh, on our website today's service we're hoping will be recorded or is being recorded and we will uh, edit that and put it out during the week uh, so watch out for the new year because i'm coming for you i want to find out your story uh, and uh, we'll record those as well we're going to stand and we're going to sing about that new life that new beginning come on let's stand
makes me sing it. That song might be slightly new to some of you, but it is a wonderful song of praise, reminding us as the Old Testament describes our God. One which is not holy. I don't know if it's Okay, I can always raise my voice, that's not good. Uh, part of it, I can use a hand. Okay. So, um, what we're going to do, we're going to read God's Word, and then we're going to look at that Word briefly together. So Martin is going to come and read the Scriptures for us. Thank you, Martin. This reading is taken from Hosea, chapter 2, verses 14 to 18, and reading from the New Living Translation. It's entitled, The Lord's Love for Unfaithful Israel. But then I will win her back once again. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her there. I will return her vineyards to her and transform the valley of trouble into a gateway of hope. She will give herself to me there, as she did long ago when she was young, when I freed her from her captivity in Egypt. When that day comes, says the Lord, you will call me my husband instead of my master. O Israel, I will wipe the many names of Baal from your lips, and you will never mention them again. On that day I will make a covenant with all the wild animals and the birds of the sky, and the animals that scurry along the ground, so that they will not harm you. I will remove all weapons of war from the land, all swords and bows, so that you can live unafraid in peace and safety. Thank you, Marty. So we've got a mic, um, as most of you know. For some preachers, speaking with a hand mic is quite difficult when they wave their arms around a lot. But hopefully you'll hear uh, what we've got to say uh, this morning. We're going to pray. We're going to ask God just to bless uh, his word uh, as we look at it. Father, we thank you again that your word is a living word, that it speaks to us in our circumstances, in our situations. And we just pray now that as uh, we look at what you have to say to us, that you would open our minds, you'd open our hearts, and you would change us as individuals. Hear our prayer. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, uh, new 12 months coming. I don't know what you're looking at uh, in this uh, coming year, whether you're expecting a good year, uh, whether you're a little bit anxious. Because let's be honest, in the last 12 months, we've experienced disappointment, uh, we've experienced trauma, and there's been a continuing kind of um, just an uncertainty, hasn't there? For every single one of us as a nation, as a world, uncertainty. And I, I guess one of the things that we're really praying is that that doesn't seep into a new year. That that sense of uncertainty doesn't seep into a new year uh, too far. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is that the media in this last week or so have done exactly what they normally do. They run off all these things about these are the great events of... Uh, 2021, uh, this is who've achieved things, this is who's died, this is where we've been politically uh, and in sporting terms, there's all those things listed out. And it's not surprising because this month, the name of this month is based on a mythological god who has two faces, one looking backwards, one looking forwards. What's interesting is God's word says to his people that we are indeed to look back, we are to recognise our history we're to look where God has led us and where we've been, but we're not to live there. We're to go forward. We're to go where God is leading us next, in the direction that God wants us to go. And that is true for us as individuals. That's true for us as a church as well. Uh, and as we come into a new year as TCC, we've got a verse that we can take through that year. Uh, that's what our text verse is about, that as a church family, God can challenge us. God can encourage us, God can comfort us when that's needed, that we can look at that verse wherever you put it, whether it's in the kitchen. It's quite interesting when I go visiting people's houses where I discover these have been put. Uh, and uh, people have got very interesting places. It's supposed to be a place where you can at least see it quite regularly. Uh, so if you've tucked it away in a cupboard, that probably is not the best idea. You know, just find somewhere to put it that you can see it. It's quite a conversational piece as well if you have visitors to your house. What's that all about? And you can talk about uh, the text for the year. So this year, 
Uh, the text comes from a, a book of the Bible, which is known as one of the minor prophets. It doesn't mean it's an uh, uh, unimportant prophet, just it's a time scale thing uh, of where the prophets came. And it's the prophet Hosea. The prophet Hosea, it is a difficult book to understand. But let's not make any bones about that. It's not an easy book to fully understand because it contains a very strange, and I mean a very strange love story. It's there as a picture. It's a picture, a living picture of the relationship between God and his love for his people. And his people, his ancient people of Israel's rejection really of that love and the, and the fact that his people hurt him regularly, that he's grieved by them, but he continues to love them despite their unfaithfulness. The first chapter of Hosea gives the picture of the prophet Hosea He's going to marry. He's going to marry a promiscuous woman, which might seem a little bit strange. But in mind, this is what we're talking as a living picture. So here is Hosea representing God, marrying, and pouring out his love, all his devotion, all his care upon a woman who is promiscuous, who is unfaithful, who goes off with other men, representing Israel, representing. God's ancient people. God is a husband. He does everything to keep that love alive. He really works at that. And yet Israel still chase after other gods, other relationships. So this book shows the deep pain that God feels when you and I are unfaithful. When we wander away from him in our sin, when we chase after other things other than him. In the second chapter of Hosea, it presents a, a different picture. It still talks about God, it still talks about uh, God's people, but God's people are struggling. They are in a valley. Some translations call it a wilderness. They, their circumstances around them are crushing in upon them. God's overwhelming love for his people is continuing despite their circumstances, but the people are feeling the problems. They are feeling the cares. They are feeling the struggles of the world. The people of God are stuck in a valley. They're stuck in a valley. There's been political turmoil. There is uh, idolatry everywhere. There is a chasing after wrong things. They're, they're, everything is a struggle. Every day is a struggle. People have become very selfish, very insular. People have grown cold towards God. They've grown cold towards God in their relationship. Others have concluded there's no reason in following God at all. And have gone after other gods completely. And there are those who are just hanging fingertips to the faith that they have. Does that sound familiar? Doesn't that sound familiar to what we have seen? 12 months of a pandemic, 18 months of a pandemic, moving into two years, being separated from the ones we love, our priorities changing, the, the view of life changing, maybe our spiritual walk with God changing. I think it's fair to say the world we live in has changed. And it won't go back to how it was. Life has changed. Church life has changed. Our priorities have dramatically changed, perhaps. The vast majority of people have found that physical separation so hard to bear. One of the things that I think has been the biggest challenge is that we are full of anxiety. We are full of anxiety, even as Christians. And this valley, for many Christians, has brought a real challenge to their relationship with Jesus. They, it's altered their relationship with other Christians, with their brothers and sisters. Some Christians who I've spoken to in the last couple of weeks no longer see any reason to together. That's no longer a priority. Sharing their faith has become outdated. Some have become the prodigal sons and daughters who've walked away from the Lord Jesus altogether. New opportunities, new challenges. So that's why this passage is so important. That's why these, this verse it is so important for us as a group of believers, as a fellowship of believers for the next 12 months. You see, because out of everything else, one of the things that we learn is that God loved his people and God does not give up on his people. Doesn't give up on his people. He continues to love us. He continues to love us however far we wander away. 
However cool our hearts become, however deep our anxiety, God still loves you and me and his church. That's good news, isn't it? But he hasn't forgotten us. God still loves us. As we heard Leslie read Psalm 23, notice what it says, that the valley, the valley of the shadow of death, it casts a shadow. It only overhangs us. You ever walked under a tree in dapple shade? That's what happens in our faith sometimes. We walk through periods of dapple shade when, when, when the, the light of Christ just doesn't seem to be bursting through in the way it did. If you don't stay under the dapple shade of the tree, you move on. And the same is true here. God has so much more for you and I. So much more in your Christian walk. So much more for us as a church. That just as in the day of Hosea, he has placed in front of us a community we are to share this good news with, and he has placed in front of us a gateway. In verse 14 of Hosea chapter 2, we see that God is leading his people through the valley, through the wilderness, not for the first time. It is a place to start over. It is a place where God pushes the reset button of our spiritual lives. It's in the valleys when that happens. The valley represents a time um, for the people of Israel. It reminds them of when they were set free from exile uh, in Egypt. God brought his people back. He led them through a wilderness, through a difficult time. But he set them free from slavery. God is, uh, God's word describes uh, this valley uh, in many translations as the Valley of Acre. The Valley of Acre. It, it's a real geographical place. It's not a made up place. It's a real place. The valley is just north, uh, uh, on the northern border of Judea, uh, near the ancient uh, city of Jericho. And it's in a deep ravine. And it's just outside that great city. This, this great deep ravine is in place. The valley derives its name uh, from an incident that you'll read of. If you go to the book of Joshua, uh, chapter 6 and 7, you will read about what happened. God has brought uh, a first victory for the people of Israel. They brought down uh, the walls of Jericho. Those of you who grew up in church life, you'll remember all the shouting about the walls of Jericho. God had a plan. It was a slightly unusual strategic plan. Um, but as the people uh, smashed vases and lights came up and they blew trumpets, the walls fell down. And, and that was a good thing, that was a good victory. But God had made a couple of things very clear. And one of the commandments that he made clear was that there were certain things that the people were not to take for themselves, they were to dedicate. And that's what we read, uh, Joshua 6, 18 says this. God says, but keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Well, nobody did, except one man, Achan. Achan was unfaithful. Along with his family, they took, Achan took, and with the help of his family, I would suggest, he hid what God had told him not to do. He hid articles, and it was disastrous. It was disastrous for the nation of Israel. They were in real trouble. They were beaten in their next battle by a tiny little uh, nation, uh, Ai. Disastrous. God's anger was poured out on the nation. Um, then Joshua and the elders fell down and, and, and prayed uh, with their, their faces in despair. And God pointed out that Achan had sinned. Achan was taken out, and along with his family, they were put to death for their sin. The sin has consequences. And that's serious consequences. They were put to death in a valley. And that valley. Is the valley we're talking of. Achan became Achan. And it means the valley of trouble. It means a place of trouble. And after all these events, the people of Israel piled up stones in the valley of Achan and said, This is what we need to remember the lesson we learned. Here, back in Hosea, God is reminding them that in their troubles, as they journey through this valley, that he is still the God who is holy. But he's the God who's put a gateway at the end. Now here's a bit of interaction for you, not the most difficult question. What's a gateway there for? Why is there a gateway in anywhere? To pass through. 
Now, I know we've got those who've lived in London, who still live in London, perhaps some of you, or visit London regularly. Marble Arch. If you ever go past Marble Arch, do you know Marble Arch was uh, designed in 1827 uh, by a man called John Nash? And it was to be, uh, any, just, uh, anybody know what it was designed for? Yeah, I knew you'd know that. Triumphal Arch to where? Do you know that? Yes. A triumphal Arch. It was. It was. It was designed to be the Triumphal Arch into what was then the grounds of Buckingham Palace. Do you know what happened in 1960 to the Triumphal Arch into the palace? In 1960, they widened Park Lane and it became a roundabout. <laughs> Nobody ever went through it. That is the danger when God puts before his people a gateway of hope. It's meant to be gone through, not skirted round. That's what he's saying to his people here. He wants them to have hope. And if our hope is to grow out of the sorrow that we have, out of the struggles, it must come from being driven to God. Your struggles, my struggles, our struggles as a church and as a nation and as a world must drive us to our Creator. That we might pass through the hope that is set before us in 2022. This verse should remind us whenever we look at it, one, God loves us, two, God's got a plan, three, there is a gateway to walk through. God's people then and now need to know how this hope works. And really quickly, and our time has gone this morning already. Three things. First, hope involves restoration. Verse 15 of Hosea 2. I will return her vineyards to her. What does that mean? In verses 8, 9, and 12, God clearly says, I've given you vineyards. Now, to you and I, a vineyard is very nice. If you have coal, a very nice vineyard next to the church. In Bible times, in Old Testament times, the vineyard, the vine, and the wine was more important than that. It was about prosperity. It was about blessing. It was about being where God wanted you to be. It, it was a, a clear picture of that. When Jesus uses parables, when he talks uh, 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 about so many things, he uses the vine dresser, or the vine, or the wine, or the grape. It's talking of blessing. Proverbs 31, it says that the, the, the wine, the grape, will bring joy to the heart that's breaking. What does it mean here? It means here that God is going to restore hope and blessing to his people who trust him. Who trust him. I think it's slightly overdone as a verse, but it is so appropriate. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans not to harm you, but to give you a hope and a certainty and a future. God has promised if we trust him, he will restore that. Second thing about hope is it involves singing. It involves a song. Now, a new year, I, I guarantee... Ooh, I don't know now. How many of you sang Old Lang Syne this year? Oh, some of you did. Excellent. Yeah, team, we did have a go. It was just you and me, and it wasn't brilliant. Um, but uh, old Lang Syne. Do you know? Again, I know we've got those with Scottish heritage here. You know, it was a Scottish folk song, Old Lang Syne. Do you know what it was written for? It was actually written for funerals. Not exactly the joyous uh, tune to be singing going into a new year. Fortunately, it, it was adjusted so it could uh, make it a little bit more palatable. But it's about singing. And here, what do we read? We read that we are to sing uh, Psalm 98, verse 1. Sing unto the Lord a new song. That's what we're to do as Christians, whether we've got a mask on or not. Here, what do we read? Again, it's useful to use a different Bible translation. Uh, the New King James translation puts verse 15 like this. I will give her a vineyard. The valley of Achor uh, is a door of hope. She shall sing there. As in the days of her youth, in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. In other words, when the people came up from the land of Egypt, they sang to be free. A day will come for us when we will sing. It's quite interesting. That verse says she will sing while she's still in the valley. She's coming up out of the valley. As God's people, we may be in the valley, but that doesn't stop us singing praises to God, does it? That's why I asked you, what should we praise God for? 
It's a picture of a song that's responsive. That's how it's worded in the Hebrew. It's a sort of response. One translation says that she will answer. If you've ever been in a church, and some traditions still do this, the choir sings something, and the congregation sing it back. But we've not really tried it. Well, we've done it in kids' songs. We've not really tried that to congregation. What's the point of that? The idea is when the choir sings, the volume goes up. Then the congregation sing it goes up more. One is lifting the other. Brother and sister, that is part of singing in the valley, that we lift each other up, that we lift each other up as we come into that gateway of hope, echoing God's good news. In Psalm 96, go home and read that if you get a chance. The final thing, hope involves a changing relationship. Our relationships have changed, haven't they? With each other, even with our own families, perhaps, from being separated. For some, that's been a good thing. Others, it's not been such a good thing. And one of the things that God wants his people to do here is to stop being distracted. To see him. There's a reoccurring problem from the nation of Israel. They chased after other gods. Particularly the god of the Canaanites, the Baals. Uh, fertility gods. God's promise in this new gateway of hope is that he will be the centre. He will be the focus Verse 16, you might have read verse 16 or listened to Mark and read that and scratch your head a bit and think, I have no idea what that means. What is, what is being said? Let me try and explain. The NIV says this, In that day declares the Lord, you will call me my husband and you will no longer call me my master. The ESV, the English translation says this, In that day you will declare the Lord, you will call me my husband and no longer my babe. Again, complicated Hebrew Phrase. What it means when it's cut down to its base is you will no longer look at me in the same way you look at the Baal gods. You will no longer look at the idols in the same way as you look at the one true God. Your focus has to change. God says this is a new, a closer relationship where you push aside the things you've been preoccupied with. It's a challenge for us, isn't it? What have you been preoccupied with in the last 12 months that isn't Jesus? This gateway of hope is there. We are to go through that. But in order to do so, we need to remember salvation is found in no one else and under, no, under heaven, no other name than the name of Jesus Christ. The devotional hymn written in 18, uh, 1918, uh, by Hel Helen Lemuel. I've quoted it before. I think it's the best instruction for our new year as we go through this valley. And it's this. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. His word shall not fail you. His promise, believe. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to the world that is dying with a perfect salvation to tell. What will you do? Will you believe what God has said? That he will transform the valley we are in into a gateway of hope that we can pass through. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus and not everything else. We're just passing through this world. So much more to come. Hold on to you. I'm going to pray and invite musicians to come up. Let's bow our heads. Lord, you've been with us this morning. You've led us and guided us and directed us. Father, we pray that, just like Mary of old, your word will dwell richly in our heart and it will change us. From this moment, we will trust you more. We will walk with you better. We will love you greater, and we will know that there is hope here and beyond this world. Here I pray this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. And we trust this God because He is great. Let's stand. Let's stand.
Guide us. Let us see soul saved this year. Let your saints be built up. Let your church develop. And Lord, may we be faithful in trusting you to lead us in hope. Now let's say the grace to each other. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Have a great 2022.